We're sitting here very low. I hope. Uh, yeah. Well, I. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody, and 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 welcome to uh, to this conversation with a, a great um, <coughs> business leader, uh, a great civil servant. As you know, um, uh, Mr. Smith is a member of our uh, Board of Regents. In fact, right now he is Vice Chairman of the Board of Regents. And he didn't even know this about himself. Uh, he's now a great author. And, and in fact, um, uh, this conversation will be about his uh, recent book published by Forbes, In the Black. And I strongly recommend um, uh, the book. It's, uh, it's just a fascinating story. It's a story of business. It's a story of leadership. And it's also a story about um, how to grow into a business where people like you are not very common, not very represented. So there are lots of lessons that I think would be would resonate with many, many of us. So um, uh, thank you, Dallas, for no. being with us today. Thank you for um, having me. And if I didn't know any better, I think my mom would have wrote that introduction. Uh, <laughs> so I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So, so um, I've, you know, I've, I've, known, I've known you as a successful business leader and, again, as a, as a member of our Board of Regents, and that is the Dallas that I knew. Then I, I, I read your book. Uh, where I you, apologize in advance. No, not at all, not at all. It's like, oh, my gosh. Here's an, uh, other facets of, of Dallas that are, that are fascinating. But let me, let me start by asking the, 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 the question, how in the, world, <clears throat> how in the world does a kid like you <clears throat> in Atlanta, who probably does not know many people in the real estate business, who probably doesn't even know what the real estate business is, um, how does that kid one day decide, I want to be a great real estate business guy? Well, um, thanks to Lurleen Smith, that was my mom. My mom raised me in a way that, and I had my father too, I should give my, I'd never give my dad credit. And <laughs> had two wonderful parents, mom and dad, but my mother was the entrepreneur in the family and she was also the one that always sort of empowered me um, to believe that I could do and be anything I wanted to be. I was the youngest of three kids, have two older sisters. Um, I was a preemie. And so even up until the time I was 55 years old, my mom passed in 2020, sure. I was still her preemie. And so uh, she you know, kept gloves around me, if you will. We spent a lot of time together, but my mom kept kids at the house. And not really until I wrote the book, I had a ghostwriter who helped me with this. And so we would talk every Sunday at one o'clock. And she says, well, Dallas, is it, the reason that you're an entrepreneur is the reason because your mom was an entrepreneur. And I never thought about my mom being an entrepreneur because she kept kids. She loved kids. Um, her nickname was Auntie. Everybody called her Auntie. She kept kids from, for 44 years. We always had at least 12 extra kids in the house. So I grew up with a lot of kids. Um, I never saw her as a business owner because she loved what she did. Now my dad was a guy who worked for Lockheed and drove a taxi. He had to punch a clock. He went to work, okay? So in my mind, he was going to work, my mother wasn't. And so my mother always sort of embodied, and she always had money, always had cash, and took, the, took August off every year, the entire year, uh, every um, year. And so I saw this, the freedom that she had and my mother, when I was eight years old, came home one day. I was skinny, big nose. I finally, I'm kind of fitting into my nose, but I was skinny and my nose was still the same size. And I came home one day crying. I said, Mom, they're calling me skinny, I have a big nose. And my mom's in the kitchen, full moo moo on, scarf. She stops, she looks at me, she says, Son, you have the nose of a king. And went back to washing dishes. I remember going to the mirror looking at it and saying, oh, that's what the king's nose looks like. <laughs> and so, so I believed everything my mom said. So we moved from Atlanta. I'm from Atlanta, born and raised. I tell people I'm Atlanta born, Atlanta bred. When I die, I'll be Atlanta dead. I love this city. Uh, but we moved to College Park when I was 14, and I was mad at my parents. We were the first black family to move to that 
to that neighborhood. First time I ever been called the N-word was the day we moved into that neighborhood. And so I got a crass course in racism. Ended up going to Lakeshore High School, which was predominantly white. Um, so I'm going from an all-black elementary school, all-black high school. I went to Turner High for one year before we went to Lakeshore. And I met two guys, um, two young guys who happened to be brothers, Stacy and Troy Gibbons. One was 14, the other was 13. And they were glad to see me, I was glad to see them. And we ended up connecting, they said, come visit. So I go to their house, and they have what we now call vision boards. But I'm 14, I had never seen anything like this. They, had, they shared a room, twin beds on both sides, full vision board, where they're gonna live, the house, I mean the car, the schools they were going to, they both were going to Morehouse. I can't remember where they were going to, to medical school, but one was gonna be an anesthesiologist, the other was gonna be a dentist, the anesthesiologist was also gonna be a pilot. Um, and so I walked in on their conversation, the 13-year-old brothers fussing with the 14-year-old brothers, like, no, I will be able to afford a Porsche 911. And they're having a debate about it. He said, no, you'll just be in your residency, you won't be able to afford it. I'd never seen anything like this because on my wall, I had a poster of Dr. J and Shaka Khan. So I didn't, <laughs> there was no vision board. <laughs> so, but I remember leaving them at 14 thinking, man, you gotta get your stuff together because these guys got it all planned out. So from 14 to 19, I'm still not really figuring out what I want to be. This is a long way for me to answer your question. But <laughs> I decided, to, I got a Forbes magazine in 1982, which happened to be the first year they start ranking the richest people. <laughs> and the 400 richest people, and I just studied what the 400 richest did now. You can do this on your phone now, it'll take you five, less than five minutes. Back then you couldn't, because there were no computers, no phones. So I took an accounting and ledger, ledger sheet I'd write down Warren Buffett, Omaha, Nebraska, his net worth investor. Donald Trump, back before he was a uh, polarizing guy, when he was a real estate guy. <laughs> Donald Trump, real estate developer, New York City, his net worth. Um, T. Boone Pickens out of um, uh, Texas, he was an old guy. I did this for everybody. So I did this for all, 14, all 400 people. And it ended up being four categories of people. So the richest people in the world did four things, one of four things. They were either in technology, which was fairly new in uh, 82, oil industry, um, investments, and real estate. As I mentioned to you, I'm from Atlanta. I wanted to stay in Atlanta. So oil would have taken me to Texas, investments, New York. Technology just wasn't my thing, so it left me with real estate. I didn't want to work on the weekends, so that knocked out residential. So I literally just backed into commercial and common sense. I thank God for common sense. Now I got to find somebody who's in commercial real estate and I was going to ask him if I could shadow them so I can figure out what I'm going to do. My sister was dating a guy named Michael Hightower who was a uh, politician in College Park at the time and Michael was the most influential person I knew so I figured I'd call an influential person, ask him if he knew somebody. He did. Bill Colmer was the guy, Colmer Properties. Um, he was kind enough um, to let me hang out with a guy named um, Steve Gautney. Steve was a real estate broker at the time. He's driving around, he's using words I never heard, acquisition, disposition, um, triple net lease. He, he's using these words, I'm trying to drink from a fire hose, keep up with him. He says, um, I'm gonna take you to a meeting, we're gonna go in the meeting, don't say anything, just you know, sit in the corner, you can ask questions afterwards. So I'm watching these two guys, two white guys come in, and it's almost like a OK Corral kind of show because I don't know if it's going to be a gunfight or whatever, but it was the temperature in the room was hot. I mean, these guys are not really getting along. This guy writes something down on a piece of paper, hands it to him. The guy goes, oh, he tears up the paper. And then he writes something on the paper, and the guy tears up the paper. It's like no words are being exchanged, and they keep going back. And then finally they go, then they shake hands. Then we leave. He said, uh, Dallas, do you have any questions? I said, yeah, it looks like um, things didn't go that easy, but it seems like you came to an agreement. He said, yeah. I said, I just have one question. I said, he said, what's that? I said, how much money are you gonna make? <laughs> he said, and this is 1982. He said, I'll make $30,000 off that transaction. The median income for a family of four in 1982 was $28,000. 
And what I just saw this guy do, I was like, hell, I can do that. I can write a thing. <laughs> I can do that. You know, so they realized a little bit more involved in that. But um, that was the beginning. And um, he took me to lunch, introduced me to a guy named Tom Thompson. Tom's a white guy. This is important to the story. Tom and I happen to be 19. We're at Georgia State now. We're both 19. He's in real estate already. He's working with his um, stepfather, who was a broker at this shop. We talked, if we talked for 10 minutes, I'd be surprised. But the conversation went something like this. I mean, I'm really thinking about getting commercial real estate. He said, man, I'm, that's what I'm doing here. I'm loving it. Are you at Georgia State? Yeah. He said, man, I've got this accounting class. It's killing me. The professor, I had just had that, that guy. I said, this is what you do. Make sure after every class, go and talk to him. He loves it when you go talk to him. Get a little extra time, FaceTime with a guy. You'll be fine. He said, all right. He said, well, if I hear anything, I'll let you know. That was it. Two days later, Tom calls me. He said, Dallas, I've got somebody who's looking to hire somebody in real estate. I said, yeah, he said. Uh, he said, can you give me your resume? Yeah, so this is back in the day for you young people. You had to get typeset resume. You couldn't do it on a computer. <laughs> you had to, you know. So it took a little while. But my birth name is Tanalo Smith. I don't have a nickname, no middle name, nothing. So the guy he told me it was, it was Tommy Tift. I said, Tiff, like T-I-F-T, -I -T, like Tiff, Georgia, Tifton County. Yes, one and the same. They owned a lot of property near the airport. So I know I've got to get my resume to them. But I go into Tennessee State before I went to Georgia State. Tennessee State, historically black college. And then I got the name Tanalo. I knew Tommy Tiff was not going to. This resume wasn't going to make it past 513. I knew that. So. What the term is now is called whitewashing your resume. I didn't know that. I just knew like hobbies. I had basketball and track, things that, that I did before. I changed all that to read golf, squash, chess team. I wanted to appear as white as possible on paper. That's what I did. This is 19 years old. I hadn't talked to anybody, didn't ask for any counsel or anything. I just knew this is what I needed to do. But I still had this thing with this name. I had this Tanalo Smith, which happens to be a Filipino name. My dad's best friend in service was Filipino. He died. He named me after him. So I grew up in Hunter Hills with that name, Tanalo. So you can only imagine. So, <laughs> but everybody called me Ty. That was my nickname in the neighborhood. So I needed to work on this name. I remember T. Boone Pickens. So I already had a T and a Smith. That's pretty generic. Anybody can have that. But I needed something in the middle. Well, in 1982, the hottest TV show around was Dallas. <laughs> so I just put T. Dallas Smith, and I went, yeah, that's it. And so now I'm giving it to my white buddy who takes it to Mr. Tiff. Mr. Tiff says he loves, loves the resume. Have your friend call me. So now I've got to call him. Now, I can't sound like a brother on the, on the phone. I've got to sound like as white as a white man as possible. And in my mind, the whitest white man in 1982 was Johnny Carson. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't even remember what Johnny sounds like now. But at 19, I, I'm 61 now, but at 19, I could do Johnny Cole. And so when I called Mr. Tiff, Johnny Carson was on the other end of that phone. We had a great conversation. He said, well, Dallas, well, I love what I hear. Can we get together tomorrow? I said, sure. <laughs> so <laughs> now I've got to. I've gone through the paper test, I've gone through the phone test, and now I've got to meet in person, right? <laughs> and so and I'm 19 and I'm thin as a rail. I'm 170 pounds now, the heaviest I've ever been. I was always around 130 pounds. I, was, I mean, I was straight up and down. And so about blue suit, white shirt, red tie. And I come in, the sec front door is about right here where the screen is behind me. Maybe the second row is where the secretary is sitting. And so she's watching me as I walk in, she goes, and I walk up to her, I said, hi, hi. Um, she said, can I help you? I said, yes, I'm here to see Mr. Tiff. And she said, and you are? I said, I'm Dallas Smith. And she literally, her body went like this, the chair went back, the wall caught her. That's the only reason she didn't hit the ground. She said, <laughs> she closed the door, she came back, she said, Mr. Tiff, we'll see you now. The story goes, she went back, she told Mr. Tiff, Dallas is here, but he's black. And Mr. Tiff goes, 
Well, since he's here, let him come on back. But this will be the shortest interview in the history of mankind. And so I go back. Again, obviously, I don't know any of this. Until this day, Tiff doesn't know I knew, know any of this. He passed a couple of years ago. Um, I'll get to that. So I come in, and Tiff is 56 years old. He's Rhett Butler from Gone with the Wind. He's a good-looking white guy, but he looks like money. He's generational money. Their, their family was in the cotton business, okay? So, yeah, it's 159 counties in the state. One of those counties is his family's name, right? So he, he meets this 19-year-old kid who's oblivious to all of this. I saw Mr. Tiff, shook his hand. Before we got ready to sit down, I had to pass his desk. He had an 8 by 10 of Ronald Reagan on his desk, black and white picture. I go, oh, are you a Reagan fan? He said, yes, I am. I said, so am I. So 19-year-old kid, I knew nothing about politics. Democrat, Republican, knew nothing about it, to be quite frank. All I knew, I was at 19, Jimmy Carter had been president. We had gas lines. Interest rates were 18%. So it wasn't about Jimmy. It was just about the other guy's got to be better. <laughs> so because I didn't want to be living at home for the rest of my life. So that was, <laughs> I didn't think I'd ever be able to afford a house at 18% interest. So that's why now at 8%, it's, it's, I tell these young people it's nothing. But anyway, we end up sitting down, because he's like a deer in headlights hearing that statement from him. We started talking. He had a tennis racket in his office. He also went to Georgia Tech, by the way. He was a Georgia Tech man. He had a tennis racket in his office. Happened to be the exact same tennis racket I had. We talked, about, we talked about Reagan for an hour. We talked about tennis for an hour. Uh, story goes, when I left, he told Susan, the secretary, I'm going to do something I thought I'd never do. I'm going to hire that young man. So Mr. Tiff brought me into the real estate business in 1982. Now, the shocking thing about his background, which he never knew that I knew, because I found out later, his father was the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan in Tifton. And so I just referred to him as Big Tiff. They didn't necessarily separate the Tiffs, the Big Tiff. So Big Tiff came to visit one day. And <laughs> Big Tiff was, I want to say he was 94, 95 years old. He had the longest Cadillac I've ever seen in my life. It had to be from that table, the end of that table to that table. He had a driver who you know, full outfit. Even the driver was white. He had a nurse that was white. Everybody around him was white. He had sort of a candy striper person who walked around with him, had the oxygen tank, old school oxygen tank, just went kind of like this. But he was severely uh, bent over. So he couldn't, if he's standing in front of you, all he could see was waist down. He couldn't, he couldn't see everything. So Mr. Tiff was yelling in his ear, Daddy! I want you to meet our new marketing director. I was marketing director at the time, um, Dallas Smith. So he put his hand out first. And so when I grabbed his hand, he literally, as his, he was ratcheted up, he stood all the way up. And the oxygen tank started going. <laughs> so Mr. Tip said, all right, Dad, I know you got to go. And they, they got him out. He kind of went like this. <laughs> A couple of days later, Big Tiff dies. So Susan, the secretary, goes, Dallas, you know you killed him. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? And she said, you didn't just kill any man. You killed the grand, drag the, the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan in Tipton. So it was at that moment when I found that out. So I tell that story for this simple reason, because I didn't allow whatever Tiff's background to impact me. I gave him the benefit of doubt, and ultimately he gave me the benefit of doubt. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of our conversations with people. We, we tag them with whatever label they have and not getting to know them. But me getting to know them, know him, change happened with him and with me. And so I always encourage people to, there's, there's gonna be people who don't look like you, but be the very person who will help you. And um, give people the benefit of doubt. That's a long story to answer. <laughs> that was one question. Twenty minutes later, I would know that was. It was um, it's a it's a fascinating story, and uh, 
by the way, uh, if you if you want more of those stories, that's the whole book is <laughs> is uh, is is filled with uh, with treasure stories, profound stories, by the way, because you're right. I mean, um, it would be very easy, or at least uh, to be expected from many of us, that when you you're exposed to reactions that reject you for who you are, that you would reject them back, yeah. and instead this idea of giving someone else the benefit of the doubt of engaging and seeing whether that interaction can change somebody's view of the world it's, uh, is, is a remarkable lesson. Let me ask you, <clears throat> you get into, into the real estate business. If there is a relationship business, I mean, talk about one, where uh, clients have had have worked with the same agents for years and years and years and years, yeah. and you are the ultimate outsider. Yes. You're new to the business. You look different. You're a totally new guy in this. Yeah. And somehow you were able to to turn that the fact that you're an outsider to turn it into into a superpower, if you will. Yeah. Tell us about so that. when I worked for Tiff. I was on the landlord side, so I represented all of his properties exclusively. He owned, um, at one time, their family owned the majority of the land where the airport sits now. But afterwards, they still had 80 acres. I think they still have maybe 60 acres to the, to, 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 to them, until today. I can't talk. Um, so tenants came to us, and I was doing the leasing. So I didn't really have to be client-facing or really have relationships, because you want our building, this is where you got to go. So then I go to Cushman and Wakefield in 1989. I'm the first black broker at Cushman and Wakefield in Georgia in 1989. They were owned by the Rockefellers. And at that time, the MO for Cushman, if you didn't come from money, you didn't work at Cushman. And as I mentioned, my parents didn't have money, but thanks for, for the grace of God is how I ended up at Cushman. That's a whole other story in itself. But now I'm client facing, I'm happy to get clients. And I realized the past six years at Mr. Tiff, I, I just didn't know how to build relationships and I didn't. I was all about the money. Give me my, give me my check, do a deal, do next checks next. That was it, I didn't, wasn't thinking long term. So 1989, I had to start all over again. And in building a relationship, I try to explain it this way. If you're married, you have a spouse, at some point, you met this person, you liked them, and surely they weren't the only person you ever dated. You dated other people before, but for whatever reason, this person was the one you said yes to, right? That's what being in a relationship is really like. It's gotta be a real commitment. What, that, what does that mean? That means I can't put your interests ahead of my interests. My wallet, my pocket won't trump my relationship with you. If I'm advising you on real estate, I've got to say, well, let's say this deal, you do this over here, I can make a million dollars, but if you did this deal, I only make $100,000. Now, for some reason, I'd kind of push you to the million dollar. That's not taking care of your interest. The interest over here may be the much better deal for you. Until you start learning those things to put the client first, um, that's a lesson that has to be learned. So, because I was all about the money in my 20s, <laughs> in my 30s. 40s, I started waking up. Now I'm all about making sure, number one, the client, I may not make anything, but that the client's interest is taken care of first. At somewhere along the road, dividends come back. It may be a relationship they introduced me to or something like that. So I understand now that relationships trump everything. It trumps money, it trumps everything. I, one of my examples, Herman Russell, who I had, when I left Cushman, I started a brokerage division for Herman Russell. Herman was a man who was wealthy beyond measure, not just in money, but also in relationships. Herman made one phone call. For, it was, um, Media One was in town, and they needed to put some uh, power notes up, like 28 different power notes. They found out that Herman was a the guy they needed to get to work. So Herman calls me down. He had a speech impediment, so he couldn't pronounce Dallas, so he called me Daryl. So he said, Daryl, you, you have any questions? I didn't even know what the meeting was. I, no. So he hands me this box. All I knew was 28 power nodes needed to be done from a um, zoning standpoint. 
So I took my box and went down to City Hall and started talking about what needed. And the woman started telling me, well, it's going to take six months for this and three months for this. I'm listening to it. It's going to take a year. We've got to get this thing done in 28 days, for 20, in 30 days for 28 properties. So I come back to HJ. I said, HJ, we got a problem. We're not going to be able to get this done. He looked at me. He said, you went through the front door, didn't you? I'm here. I'm like, what, what other door am I supposed to go through? So he, he, his secretary, he says, get Johnny on the phone. I don't know who Johnny is. Secretary, how she always knew who to get on the phone was always amazing to me. And he just said, hey, I'm sending my man Daryl down there. He needs some help on something. He said, all right, Mr. Russell. He hung up the phone. I go back down there with this box. The woman who saw me first, she's like, I, you know, I, the guy sticks his head out. Are you Daryl? I said, yeah, I'm Daryl. <laughs> So I go back with my box. He said, what you got there? And I have their number, one through 28. And he um, takes the first folder out, pulls the approved stamp out. Says, so where are you from? Are you from Atlanta? Where are your people from? <laughs> the man approved all, <laughs> all those sites in 30 minutes with a stamp. Now, if somebody actually had to pay for that, that time, the lawyers, everything else, it would cost a whole lot more than this man did in one phone call. That's the power of a relationship. And so what I understand now, the relationship is more powerful than anything mon monetarily. And so I've leaned on that. And so one, after, one client after the other has come to us as a result of that and um, making sure that we take care of the client's interests first. There, um, throughout the book, I mean, there are at least three people, there are more, but at least three people that you very clearly mention as mentors, advocates, allies, people who, without whom you would have never made it, right? You talked about Tift, yes. uh, Mr. Russell. Yes. You also, uh, in that list, you, you have a professor at Georgia State, oh, yeah. David Schwartz. David J. Schwartz. And given our line of business here, I was very intrigued by, by how a professor really oh. changed the way you, you thought about your own life. The man, the man changed my life. So David Schwartz wrote the book, The Magic of Thinking Big. Um, he was one of the, the first gurus to do sort of positive thinking kind of thing. Um, I'm already in my career with Mr. Tiff, and I'm really thinking to myself, why do I even need college? I don't really need this. But I'd already registered, and I had registered for this one guy, Dr. Schwartz. White students at Georgia State, a lot of them thought just that he's the biggest asshole you ever go meet. <laughs> Black students thought he was the biggest racist you ever go meet. And my mom always taught me to go see for yourself. So I, so it was, but then there was this one slither of people who he changed my life. He was, I mean. They had him on the, 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 the top of the totem pole. So I got to see this for myself. I was already in my career, so I was already in suit and tie. And this is a lecture hall with about 200 people. I always sat on the front row, not knowing I really couldn't see well. That's why I sat on the front row. <laughs> but um, it's 200 students. It's one black kid, that's me, and 199 white kids. And in comes Dr. Swartz, who um, he's actually Amish. Um, but he's a white man, he comes in limping. He's smoking an unfiltered cigarette that he puts out on a sign that says no smoking. So, and, and when he does that, I, I realize on this sign that says no smoking has all these divots where he's done this <laughs> a few hundred times. So, and then he, you know, lurches up to the front, throws his uh, briefcase onto the, 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 the podium. My name is David J. Swartz. I am the CEO of this class, and you are my employees. I won't pay you with money, but I'm gonna pay you with grades. So he turns behind, got this big board behind him, he pushes it to the side, and it says, A, one, president. B, 10, vice presidents. C, 80, managers. Then it was D, stock boys, <laughs> stock boys and girls, and there was, there was a number, and then F's janitors. These were the positions that he was filling in his class. <laughs> so 
So only one A was going to be given to the president of the class. 50 people just got up and then <laughs> walked out of the class. I'm intrigued because I've never seen anything like this. And so he goes, all right, you heard from me. Let's hear from you. And he points at me. So I get out from where I was sitting. I come up to the stadium. And he's behind the podium. I said, excuse me. He didn't move. I said, excuse me. He didn't move. I said, excuse me. He didn't move. So I just pushed him out of the way. I introduced myself. I'm Dallas Smith. I've just been named marketing director of Atlanta Air Center Realty with Mr. Tiff. And I'm going through this thing. I don't remember all I said. He stops and starts hitting on the ta table. Hold up, hold up, hold up. And what is your name? I said, Dallas Smith. He said, Smith, you have it. Smith, you're going to sit on corporation boards. You're going to be an important advisor. He starts saying all these things that I was going to do. And quite frankly, the things he was saying were things that I had in my deepest, darkest part of my heart that I never sh shared with a living soul. But here's this white man <laughs> saying all this stuff in front of a room full of white people about me. I was hooked. Needless to say, I was hooked. I was the president of every class I was with, Mr. T with uh, Dr. Swartz. Um, he changed my life. I would get to his office before time to go to class. I walked with him to class. When we left, I'd walk with him back. He was a fascinating guy. One of my favorite stories, I was late registering. This was back in the day, too. You had to do it by hand. It wasn't the stuff you could do on the phone now. I was late registering. Something happened at Georgia State. So I'm coming in like a, a day late. So I say, this is Monday, Wednesday classes. I didn't miss Monday, so I'm at the Wednesday class. Again, I always dress nice. Now we're into our major, so the classes are getting smaller, so there's maybe 30 people in the class. And I look through the, the classroom door, the window, and I see this young white guy sitting on the desk with Dr. Schwarzenegger. Immediately, I know he's the president of the class. He's been named president of the class. So I said, okay. So I'm just, I come in, and I'm going to walk through the side. Dr. Schwarzenegger, oh, Smith, Smith, is that you? I said, Dr. Schwarzenegger, I apologize. Registration had a problem. I'm late registering. I'll take a seat back here. He said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, how many people know Smith? And so like I had the class. Where I was in. And he said, hey, Smith, some of these people don't know you. And the guy sitting on the table is looking like, what the hell? So he tells him, hey, hey, just move, move. <laughs> he said, hey, class, I wanted to introduce you to your new president, Dallas Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and so he just he moved the white guy away. So now I'm sitting here you know, pontificating about who I am and what I'm going to be doing. And um, a couple days later, I'm walking. Uh, Dr. Schwartz back from class. He goes, Smith, look at this. And it was, it was a withdrawal slip from the guy who had been president for a couple of days. <laughs> so he said, well, I knew he didn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of boost from a guy who, again, everybody had different views about him, but he really empowered me in a way that really changed my life. He died in 1989. Not a day goes by, I don't think about him. That's, That's the power of a teacher. <clears throat> Power of a, of a teacher. Yes. And um, <clears throat> you mentioned his book, The Magic of Thinking Big, which yes. uh, is a very interesting um, <laughs> book, really, about, about positive thinking. But yes. let me ask you about one transaction yes. where I uh, first became uh, aware from, uh, of your work from a business perspective was the, the Microsoft transaction. And it's a very interesting transaction with many different interesting dimensions. Mm -hmm. So I, I, was, I was fairly new in my job, and I, and I traveled to Seattle. Microsoft is one of the biggest, uh, probably the biggest employer of uh, Georgia Tech grads. Mm -hmm. We are uh, the second largest source of talent. So it's a very close relationship. I, I went by their offices in, uh, in Seattle, and I met the, the head of uh, global real estate. Michael Ford. And he confided that they had plans to, uh, to do something big in Atlanta. So we sat down, shut the door, and I said, so wh wh where are you thinking? I was pretty convinced that it would be somewhere in, in Tech Square. And we pulled the map, um, and, and he says, no, we're thinking about this neighborhood. This is west of our campus, about two miles west of our campus. Yes. I'm like, wow, that's an interesting. This is the first tech company that I know of that is considering setting up. Do you know uh, what this neighborhood is like? 
and the issues that he has. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he was ex he knew exactly what 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 types of issues and and opportunities it, it had. Uh, fast forward a few months, and uh, the announcement is made that uh, Microsoft has uh, has purchased a, a, a pretty uh, large piece of land right west of our of our of our campus. And then at that point, uh, then I learned that um, uh, Mr. Smith had actually uh, been the uh, been working for Microsoft on that transaction. Yeah. Also. Another Georgia Tech connection. It turns out that uh, our alum Mark Teixeira was on the selling side. That was Mark a, did okay. That, that he uh, did he did okay. Yeah, but but okay. the 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 how do you get the business of one of the biggest corporations in the world? Yes. Um, how do they decide that they're going to be on the west side? Yeah. And what do you think they impact? I mean, there's so many dimensions yeah. to that to that transaction that I would love to hear. Yeah. So two thoughts. so. Okay, I've been in this business a long time, 42 years now. I know how to hunt. If nothing else, I know how to hunt. And one of the things that we do every year, we go to this thing called Cornet. Cornet is a real estate event, basically with heads of real estate show up and real estate brokers show up. Every year they have a book that comes out and I, I look and see who the speakers are, which companies they are. So I'm flipping through, imagine what I've been doing all my life all, all my bosses who I report to, my clients, 98% are white and usually male. So that's the MO for people who I typically report to. Then I see this black guy's face, I'm going, Rrr. and it says global head of real estate, Microsoft. I'm thinking it's a typo something. So we have our meeting with everybody who's going out to Cornet. I say, we're looking for this guy. Everybody's looking for this guy. One of my guys in my office, um, Cedric Matheny, who was one of my partners, sees him first. And he says, um, are you Michael Ford? And he says, yes, I am. He said, we've been looking for you. He said, why are you looking for me? He said, because you're the global head of real estate for Microsoft. Microsoft. <laughs> A few minutes later, we all <laughs> show up. I'm there. And Mike, just he's just a real dude. Um, you know it when you, you know, you know it when you see it. Um, this is the best way I'm gonna say it, because this is, when you're, in a, when you're in a professional environment on hell, this is, a, this is a proper greeting, right? Now, when a brother see another brother, you give him, it's more like this. You, yeah. you, know, you, 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 you go all in like that, right? Mm -hmm. And Mike greeted me like that. I was like, oh yeah, this is my man. <laughs> and we just hit it off immediately. Um, he gave me his background, his story. We actually went to a couple of um, events together at the at Cornet. He invited us to come um, tour Microsoft's campus, which was awesome. Went through the famous treehouse, took a photo. I said, can we take a photo in the treehouse? He said, sure. He said, On, under one condition. I said, what's that? He said, you have to post it to LinkedIn because you know Microsoft owns LinkedIn. So we took the photo, it, you know, we put it on LinkedIn immediately. We go back to the conference. All of my buddies, and I mean, you can imagine, 90% of, 95% of my friends in this industry are white men. And so all my guys like, hey, Dallas, were you at Microsoft's campus? I said, yeah. So how, how did that happen? I said, Some, somebody invited us. So I just, that happened all day. And Mike and I just built a real relationship again around how can we help you? Ultimately, we end up this assignment that was coming. So the, the 90 acres sort of a sore spot kind of because the development has not happened. But first was the 17th Street with the Atlantic Station when you're going down and you see that, that was the first. And in 2020, that was the largest transaction in the United States, 523,000 square feet. And so, and it was five black guys who did the transaction, my five partners, it's five guys who owned the, the company. Um, when that happened, the floodgates opened. We get a call from um, Airbnb, Dallas. Uh, now, it was funny, very different than Microsoft, because Microsoft was very hush-hush. We had code names, we had everything. Airbnb was like, hey, um, we want to hire you to do the same thing for us. You mind if we write an article? <laughs> I said, sure. <laughs> yeah, so 
the article was written and then we ended up doing some other companies I can't even name, but we represented probably 10 companies as a result of that. And momentum is a beautiful thing because once you get momentum, everybody's calling you. I had three, four billionaires who called me during that time who owned buildings all around. Wanted to know why we didn't bring clients to them. <laughs> so we started building relationships with them. Uh, one of them was a guy named Young Wu, who's a good friend now. Uh, we met in 2020. Young tells a story, I never returned his call, which is interesting because I don't answer my phone. If you, if you, if you have my cell phone, I answer it. But if you call my desk, you gotta leave a message and then I'll listen at some point. Like I probably, the light's blinking right now, I hadn't listened to messages, it's probably some deals. My office would be mad at me, but I will get to it. But that's the whole thing. Ultimately, at the end of the day, our thing is make sure we take care of the client. So now this, Microsoft would do this thing called a heat map. The heat map judges the interest from other locations. Atlanta had the hottest heat map of any location on the planet. And so that's when the other, we needed more sites. So I said, Mike, if you want to do usual, business as usual, we do Midtown, we do Buckhead, Sandy Springs maybe, I don't know. But if you want to do something that's very different, I said, let's jump Northside Drive. He said, what do you mean? I said, for years, Northside Drive has been the red line. If you, all you got to do is go down Northside Drive and you'll see, you know, even the stadium sits on, the billion dollar stadium sits on this side, it does not sit on this side. I said, spoken, unspoken, that has been a, it's an, you know, it's our, it's our wall, it's our wall, you know, the Berlin Wall is right here. I said, if you really want to do something different, let's jump that. Mark Teixeira's site was a 90 acres, has a pathway, I mean, it's all four paths go right into that site. Beltway, the path, the, the, the cut zoo trail, everything goes there. Uh, it's kind of reminiscent of the, the Microsoft headquarters. There's waterfalls, there's, I mean, all this stuff, Proctor Creek. So we look at it, sorry, and he, he understands the impact we could have. And Egbert Perry and I start, have been working, this is, this is a segue. You ask the question, how did this really happen? So I'm on, my, I'm on Georgia State, I'm on the foundation board, and I'm chairing the real estate committee. I'm about to roll off, I did uh, nine years on that board. So I take um, uh, Becker and Walter Massey, all of them, I say, hey man, I wanna take you guys out to Microsoft's campus, because I wanna get some ideas from Microsoft's campus that we could possibly do for Georgia State. So we take them out there. So it's me and six white people. I'm meeting with Michael, he's got six white people. This wasn't planned, it's just, apparently six was a number. So, <laughs> but I had moved, the company's taken off and I'd moved, um, I'd gone through the recession, had lost all my money in 2007, had to learn how to walk again kind of thing. So we were uh, in a condo downtown, but the woman wanted, we were leasing it, she wanted to sell it. I didn't have time trying to make a decision. My wife says, why don't we just move back home with your mom? while we figure out what we're doing. My father had passed, and we had a chance to live with my mom for a year. So, but the joke became, I'm doing, I'm doing millions of dollars of real estate for companies, but I'm living with my mom. <laughs> so I walk into Microsoft's uh, headquarters, and Mike's there, again, it's, it's Mike sitting here, he's got three white people here, three white people here. I'm walking in, I got Becker, I got three white people, <laughs> we walk in, and Mike greets me like this, Dallas, you still living at home with your mama? I said, yes, I am still living home with my mama. In fact, she cooked fried chicken last night and, and uh, fried corn. I don't know if I'm ever gonna leave. She's washing clothes. I, why would I leave? So, so Becker starts chiming in. Yeah, he's, we had just bought the stadium for Georgia State. And he said, he's doing all these deals and he's living home with his mom. So it became a joke. So I sat down, uh, Egbert and I have been meeting um, for, for some years. And I, there's a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. Small minds discuss people, average minds discuss events, but great minds discuss ideas. The first time I saw that was at Denzel Washington's house. You have to read the book to figure out how I ended up at Denzel Washington's house. But he had a plaque in his backyard with that saying, which really impacted me. I said, that's a powerful statement. So Egbert's one of the smartest guys I know. I tell Egbert this quote, we gotta get together, start solving problems. So the problem we're gonna solve is housing. So when Mike said, you said only about home with your mom, I said, yeah. So I said, here, Mike, this is what I want to do. So I took a uh, napkin. We at, used to meet at Thumbs Up, just down the street on Marriott Street. I took a napkin, drew these four boxes, not realizing I'm drawing Microsoft's logo, not even realizing. So 
I said, I want to do this thing called empowerment housing, where we empower people from a legislative standpoint, from legacy residents to be able to buy a quad. They have to live in one, stay there for at least five years, but from day one, they can lease these other three. So now they're landlords and they're making income. They're not just renters. And Egbert, we'd go back and forth and Egbert said, man, you, you own to something. So I'm showing this to Michael, to Michael Ford and I'm sitting down, Michael's standing up and he looks at me, he goes, Dallas, you own to something. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, Microsoft, we come in and we put a half million square feet in anywhere USA, we're gonna gentrify that community because the people who are gonna be able to afford to live there and wanna walk to work are gonna be our, our executives. He said, but if we're able to do what you're talking about doing, the people who clean our buildings, the people who protect our buildings can live in the neighborhood. Keep me posted on that. And so when I leave, I call Egbert, I said, man, you know the thing we've been doing for the last two years? Microsoft can get behind it. He said, what are you talking about? So that's literally, Atlanta was not on Microsoft's radar. I almost called this book, Thank God I'm Living at My Mama's House, but I didn't. <laughs> but really, if I hadn't been living at my mama's house, that whole conversation wouldn't have happened. And then Mike came to town to meet with Egbert. He started looking at Atlanta, and in Atlanta, we realized one thing for sure, this thing called Georgia Tech. The talent at Georgia Tech was a talent that Microsoft wanted. It's the same talent that all the tech <coughs> companies want. So proximity to Georgia Tech was important. And so we started talking about the history of Georgia Tech. Techwood Homes was right across the street and not one student, not one person from, Georgia, from Techwood Homes went to Georgia Tech. Start just talking about all these things, the history of the university. And if we really want to do something, let's do something transformative to really impact the community. And so first it was uh, Atlantic Station and then the 90 Acres. And we're still, some, some more good things are going to come out of that. Uh, but that's how it happened in, in, that's long, amazing. in a long story short. Yeah. <laughs> a long story long, I should say. Yeah. No, but that, you know, it's, it's amazing on how you describe your own journey as you know, you're initially you're just worrying about yourself, your money, making money, your career. Then you move on to this building, building a, a company, building an organization, mentoring others. And then there's the last phase, which I, I, I think you undervalue. No, you use a term, which is kind of funny. You say the mascot. You become the mascot. Yeah. I think it's much bigger than that. Because yeah. now you're moving from building an organization to how can you have a positive impact for the community and for everybody. And the, and the story you just mentioned really highlights that, right? Yeah. The younger version of you would have not thought of that. Oh, no. And, but, um, and I could be there here all day because the, you know, the stories are amazing. But I want to give you a chance before we wrap up to, as, uh, as Georgia Tech students or students from any of our other universities or alma mater or Georgia State or anywhere else, as they, they look at you, what's the message from your, from your career? What is it that the younger, your, your younger uh, self would have loved uh, to, to hear from someone? What's your message to them? Always stay green enough to grow. Um, you know, just, I tell people tomorrow, I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. And the day I stop doing that, just put me in the box. Um, when I hear people say, well, this is just how we've always done it kind of thing, that drives me crazy. Always stay green enough to grow and also give people the benefit of a doubt. Um, because oftentimes we want to get the benefit of the doubt, but we're not giving it to the other person. And that goes so, I, I tell people, if George Floyd had been given the benefit of the doubt, he'd still be alive. If Ahmaud Aubrey was been given the benefit of the doubt that he was just jogging and that still, he'd still be alive. So that's something that we can control. Um, just look for good in people. I've, I've met more good people than I have bad people. And because I'm looking for good in people. And people really don't disappoint me. Some do, but the reality of the mass is if I meet 100 people and one person disappoints me, I'm doing pretty good. 99 is still an eight. Um, so stay green enough to grow, give people the benefit of the doubt. And, uh, impact somebody else's life by telling your story. That's another reason why I wrote the book. Herman Russell wrote his book. I love Herman, uh, but Herman was in his 80s when he wrote his book. I was hell bent that by the time I turned 60, I had to have my first book done. 
because I knew Herman had at least 12 more books in him. If anybody knew Herman, he was that guy. And so I want to make sure if I get hit by a bus today, people will know how this little kid from Atlanta, from zip code 30314, uh, was able to do what he's doing. And I'm sitting here today at Georgia Tech's campus being interviewed by the president of Georgia Tech. This was not in my future. This was not my reality. But God is amazing. And things that God can do through people by giving people the benefit of the doubt is I think is one of the most godly things that we can do. So that's what I would say. And that wraps it up. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Thank you.